These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The Oldest Stories hiatus continues, and massive thanks to Trevor Cully for filling in for a few weeks, and also for filling in a part of the story that, honestly, I never knew very much about. If you haven't yet checked out his History of Persia podcast, I can't recommend it enough. The last few weeks have shown that he is great at producing an interesting and factual narrative out of what are some really scanty records. And of course, the History of Persia itself is basically the sequel to this show, or at least this show once it's finished, picking up the story right where the age of Mesopotamian dominance ends. Anyway, inspired by Trevor, I'm using what free time I have during this pretty busy period of my life to try and fill in some gaps in the Bronze Age before we move on to the Iron Age. Uh, geographically, the biggest remaining gap, which will become a bigger issue as the story continues and widens its focus to the whole Near East, is the land of Canaan, or the Levant, or Phoenicia, or Palestine, or the Mediterranean East Coast, or Syro-Palestine, or the Jordan Rift Valley, or the Promised Land, or even a few other potential names for the region where modern-day Israel, Lebanon, and West Syria sit. Now, each one of these names has problems and uncertainties. Some are too big, some are too small, some really don't fit in all the relevant time frames, and some are heavily political for one reason or another. It is a tough region to study for reasons I'll be getting into, but even before that, it's a tough region to clearly define. Now, for this podcast, I'm mostly going to be talking about Canaan, because I anticipate discussing the Kingdom of Israel in the second season of the show. But know that when I talk about Canaan, I'm meaning this whole poorly defined area. And speaking of poorly defined, sometimes I call it Canaan, sometimes I call it Canaan, which is correct. I don't know. I've heard that both are correct from different people who were equally sure that one was correct and the other was wrong. I don't care. I'm going to go with both, just depending on how I feel. So, just so you know, that's how I roll. But even once we decide what this region is, which is easy to conceptualize generally on a map, even if it's hard to pin down precisely, it turns out to be one of the most difficult regions to study in the entire Near East. Urbanization in Canaan began around the same time as it did in Egypt and Mesopotamia, with some saying it's slightly later in Canaan, and what is likely the oldest city in the region, Byblos, has probably been continuously inhabited since around 5000 BCE, maybe a few thousand years earlier, who really knows? The nearby coastal cities of Sidon and Tyre may be of similar antiquity, or only slightly younger, depending on who is doing the estimate. But the fact that many of these cities are located in the exact same spot as modern cities means that quite a lot has been destroyed through inhabitation over millennia, and modern excavations digging beneath occupied cities is incredibly difficult and often completely impossible. After all, who wants their house torn up because someone wants to find some clay potsherds? Uh, not me, but I don't have that problem. I live in places that have no history. Thus, while we know that the cities and peoples of Canaan were just as advanced and literate as their neighbors in Egypt and Mesopotamia, we have only a tiny fraction of the archaeological and written records here. Most of what we do know is based on what their neighbors said about them, very limited archaeological work in a handful of towns, and one city at the very north end of our region named Ugarit, which was destroyed suddenly at the end of the Bronze Age during the collapse of the Hittite Empire, and which was never inhabited again, giving archaeologists what currently appears to be the one and only major Canaanite city that can be thoroughly investigated. And to make things even more complicated, this city of Ugarit isn't even Canaanite by many definitions of the term. And so, now that we're thoroughly confused, our story properly starts before Canaan was even a name for the place, at least as far as we can tell. 
being located right at the outlet of Africa, as well as at a crossroads for people passing through Anatolia, the Caucasus, Mesopotamia. The Levantine region in general seems to have seen many, many migration waves passing through, some pausing, some moving on, some displacing locals and some integrating with them. Geographically, this is a very diverse and broken region, with numerous hills, valleys, and small river systems, as well as a transition climate that changes between the coastline to the Jordan Valley in less than a hundred miles, then shifting to the deeper deserts of the Transjordan in the south and the North Mesopotamian Euphrates Valley in the north. There is no shortage of places in this diverse field for a wide variety of peoples to find their niche. Metalworking enters the region quite suddenly, around 4500 BCE. But even by this point, we already have a diverse array of peoples making their living in agricultural communities, in pastoral tribes, in nomadic extended families, and even in large cities with flourishing maritime trade networks. Our history, properly speaking, begins in Byblos, and it's told almost exclusively through Egyptian eyes, for Byblos was an important trading partner for the Egyptians all the way back at the beginning of unified Egypt during the first few dynasties of the Old Kingdom. Though the first signs of inhabitation at Byblos date to perhaps 8000 BCE, Writing begins here a bit after it emerges in Mesopotamia and Egypt around 2600 BCE. And from here, it passes into the rest of Canaan. Still, we know that even before they had local writing, they were trading with the Egyptians and, through that, growing to become the most important city in the region. Byblos is, in a way, exceptional among early Levantine cities, for it had not only a great location for a port with a natural harbor and easy access to the famous Lebanese cedar trees that are still on the Lebanese flag today, but also was one of the only places in the entire Near East that had mineral deposits of both copper and and tin, meaning that they could provide the two most critical strategic resources to anyone in the Near East, good wood and good bronze, just from their backyard. I should not need to elaborate too much on the value of bronze in the so-called Bronze Age, though, in fact, I am planning on putting an episode together where I elaborate in great detail about bronze and how it was made and how it was used, but I also shouldn't overstate its importance either. While it isn't clear just how much exploitable mineral Byblos actually possessed, there seems to have only been a limited amount of it, and certainly by the end of the Bronze Age, we hear no more of tin mines in the region, these at least having long since dried up, and the copper mines may or may not still be there as well. The cedars, however, are perhaps even more important and valuable, being a critical component of Egyptian shipbuilding, ultimately necessary for the long expeditions that pharaohs love to boast about in the Old and Middle Kingdoms. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you really should be listening to Dominic Perry's History of Egypt podcast, which goes over these Old and Middle Kingdoms in fantastic detail. He's a real expert. I'm just an enthusiastic amateur. The cedar wood is also an attractive aromatic wood used in Egypt, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia, not just for construction of prestigious things like temple doors and furniture, and oh, you could make a, a chest like a box out of this cedar wood, and anything inside the box would, you know, have that nice smell when you pulled it out. It's really, it's like magic. But also, just by itself, the cedar was used as a sort of air freshener, or the sap was used as a sweet oil like perfume. But we shouldn't just think of ancient Byblos as a passive enjoyer of resource wealth, like some sort of Bronze Age Saudi Arabia that happens to be blessed with minerals and they just, you know, sell them everywhere. Rather, 
The great achievement of Byblos that put them so far above their neighbors was that they not only managed to be, you know, present near this wealth, which didn't hurt, but they also multiplied it with remarkable technological innovations. Now, those cedars, they were not easy to chop down with only bronze tools, but getting the hundred-foot-long tree trunks back to the city for processing required that Byblos store these trunks alongside the river all throughout the year. Then, at the point of the year when the snow melt in the upper mountains made the river swell to its highest point, then they would send all those stored logs downstream to be caught by folks waiting in the city at the end of the river. Controlling the mining, smelting, alloying, and casting of both copper and tin into bronze items also likely bespoke a high level of technical competence, especially in the workmanship of the final products. But the high point of Biblosian technical expertise was their skill as shipbuilders and navigators. The Egyptians of the Old Kingdom speak highly of a certain kind of ship, called the Byblos ship, constructed in the shipyards of Byblos out of Lebanese cedar wood. These were the great ships of the day. Egyptian watercraft was generally built for the Nile, and struggled once it got out to the, to the tougher waters of the open sea. But a Byblos ship could carry the 20 to 30 meter long logs all the way to the mouth of the Nile without any problem then returned to their city, guided into port by the 28-meter-tall lighthouse, possibly one of the world's oldest that sat outside the city, as well as by the consummate skill of the Biblosian seafarers. Indeed, while we only know of expeditions by foreigners into Byblos at this point, the economy of the matter strongly suggests that for every foreign expedition into Byblos, the people of Byblos were sending at least a good handful of their own expeditions out to foreign nations. The first great Egyptian expedition known to head in that direction was sent by the great pyramid builder of the 4th dynasty, Pharaoh Sneferu, around 2500 BCE. However, before any known Pharaonic expedition, we have evidence of Lebanese cedar wood in graves of Abydos as old as 2900 BCE, suggesting that not only was Byblos sending its wealth to foreign nations long before those nations had the capacity to reach Byblos themselves, but also that they were building these very great ships in the pre-literate period. Now, similarly, on the other side of the Near East, we have tales of mighty Gilgamesh traveling all the way to Lebanon to harvest the cedars of that land. Now, while we can't take anything in the Epic of Gilgamesh as literally true, the tradition that a king of Uruk during the Uruk period, which ran a couple hundred years around 3000 BCE, made a great westward expedition is certainly plausible. After all, we have indications of a poorly attested and possibly mythic conqueror, Lugal Animundu, doing a similar thing around 2500 BCE, and we know for sure that Sargon of Akkad reached the same area, with great difficulty, around 2300. None of these accounts mention Byblos itself, and likely these men dealt with the other towns that were rather closer to the Euphrates River for their wood. But the fact that they knew this wood was there, and the fact that it was least somewhat accessible at various times, suggests to us that traders were coming down that river, even when the great conquerors were having trouble making their way up it. Now, Byblos, however, had a special relationship with Egypt, attested in archaeology by the fact that we find vastly more Egyptian trinkets and gifts in Byblos than in any other neighboring city. Especially in the 3rd to 6th dynasties of Egypt, the height of the pyramid building age, cedar was beloved by Egyptian royalty for use in prestigious constructions, and in Byblos itself we find many inscriptions by both kings and queens of the Old Kingdom. Most significantly, the massive temple of the patron goddess of Byblos, Baalat Gabal, 
which was built as early as 2800 BCE and actively used and renovated until Roman times, has entire rooms dedicated to Egyptian patrons, full of Egyptian-style art and writing, built at various times throughout the Old Kingdom period of Egyptian history. Now, even in Egypt, it was recognized in ceremonies to the Egyptian goddess Hathor that Baalat Gabal was the same goddess, just with a different name. And the Egyptians occasionally marked the significance of the Byblos temple, even in Egypt itself. Now, Byblos grew wealthy in these early years, both selling their local goods to Egypt and, soon enough, becoming a way station for traders across the Near East. But that prosperity does not appear to have translated into empire. During the Old Kingdom, Egypt did not rule over Byblos, nor any part of Canaan, and the relationships were strictly mercantile and cultural. Perhaps more surprisingly, while Byblos did rule over a handful of nearby villages in its direct sphere of influence, it doesn't appear to have gone around conquering its neighbors. When the major city-states of Canaan did go to war, no lasting conquests or empire building appears to have resulted at this point. While Byblos seems to have dominated the region for at least a few hundred years, what effects that dominance had on the surrounding cities and tribes is uncertain, and honestly, likely minimum. Indeed, dominating the region is probably the wrong word. A better description might be that Byblos had the highest score on some imaginary city prosperity scoreboard, and no one else was close during this time. But what that got them, aside from, you know, a higher standard of living among the upper class within the city itself, is kind of unclear. Indeed, in the whole Levant, we see curiously little interest in the sort of empire building that had finished up in Egypt and was going on in Mesopotamia, as events there led up to the founding of the Akkadian Empire. Cities, small villages, and nomadic tribes all coexisted, without any one group totally conquering the others. Now, they certainly had wars, but for whatever reason, the geography, economies, and societies of Canaan in the third millennium simply weren't conducive to anything but complete systemic fragmentation. While we have far less information about what else was going on outside of Byblos, we know that many other ancient cities like Jerusalem, Sidon, Tyre, Beirut, Jericho, Arwad, Tripoli, Acre, Jaffa, and Ugarit, and many, many others, each of which were notable cities in their own little corner of Canaan, were all founded during the Bronze Age and active during this time. Similarly, there's no way to count or keep track of the many tiny tribes that passed through the spaces between these cities, spaces which were often basically uninhabited and which no settled society even bothered claiming control over. For such a small space, there's quite a lot going on, nearly all of which has been lost to history. One notable exception to the lack of conquest in the region is the small empire of Ebla, which may have begun expanding around 3500 BCE, and thus holds a possible claim to the world's first empire or large territorial state, though much surrounding Ebla is obscure in the early periods. Not part of Canaan, by any proper definition, Ebla is part of the wider Levant, or Syrio-Palestinian region. Ebla is located a bit southwest of Aleppo, and through the early Bronze Age, it gradually conquered through military and economic force the neighboring cities on the Syrian plain. From the area around Damascus in the south up to the northern Euphrates, forming an empire that, on a map, looks vaguely like modern-day Syria, though Ebla controlled either none or very little Mediterranean coastline. The Eblite kingdom 
looks a great deal like the Sumerian kingdoms that were rising at the same time, fairly loose tributary networks in which the vassal cities retained a relative degree of independence, though Ebla managed for a few hundred years in the third millennium to avoid the instability of the Sumerians. Or, if it was unstable, we don't know about it. Now, Ebla is rarely mentioned nowadays without also discussing Mari, the city on the Euphrates which founded a rival kingdom and which would eventually destroy Ebla. But if Ebla is at the edge of Canaanite history, Mari is at the edge of Mesopotamian history and was already discussed in the various places in the main episodes of Season 1. Canaanite history, throughout the early Bronze Age then, points us to a diverse patchwork of cities and peoples. Though bordered by mighty Egypt on the south and by Ebla's kingdom, later replaced by the Akkadians and then other kingdoms, through the beginning of history, no Canaanite ever rose to domination. And despite the advantageous location and valuable resources, no empire managed to push in and conquer it. Now, the reasons for this are unclear. Geography likely played a role, and probably the cultures of the region were committed to independence, and also, even though they all look real close together on a modern map, getting just from Egypt to Canaan, or Mesopotamia to Canaan, in the early Bronze Age was actually really hard, especially if you had a big group like an army trying to get over there. It's just logistically difficult. But whatever the reasons may have been, Canaan prospered until the final century of the 3rd millennium BCE. We may recall from Sumerian history that the Ur dynasty, the final great Sumerian kingdom, fell right around the year 2000 BCE to invaders called the Amorites. Now, that whole dynasty was summarized in episodes 24 and 25, and the fallout is discussed in episode 32 for those who didn't quite start at the beginning, which is fine. Don't worry about it. Where those Amorites came from exactly is unclear, but the Mesopotamians saw them as Westerners. For the people in the West, the Canaanites, the Amorite invasions came from the eastern deserts, or perhaps from the north, and were as destructive to these cities as they was to the cities of Mesopotamia. Already Canaan, and especially Byblos, was suffering from a decline of trade at this time, with the fall of Egypt into the first intermediate period, as well as perhaps the same region-wide climate issues that had affected Egypt and Mesopotamia around that time, and this set of invasions on top of that seems to have sealed the deal for the region, with a number of destruction markers evident in the archaeology around 2100 to 2000 BCE, as well as a few places where settled habitation ceases for a time, including Byblos for perhaps a century. The cities and tribes of Canaan had, prior to this, been expanding their trade with Mesopotamia, and the loss of this trade to the front end of the Amorite invasions may have played a role in the eventual fall of Ur. Despite the destructiveness of the Amorite invasions, Canaan in the Middle Bronze Age recovered quickly, and life continued on, much like how Mesopotamia quickly recovered. In both cases, we transition kind of smoothly into a new power structure, but one where the fundamentals are very similar to how things were before, just with more Amorite rulers and an increased Amorite population. In modern times, it's popular to call these the Amorite migrations among certain scholars to emphasize that it was a movement of peoples and not a coordinated military activity. But my own opinion here is that the level of destructiveness was in fact great enough to call it an invasion, even if it was a decentralized one. Soon enough, our history in Byblos returns back to normal, as trade relations with Egypt pick back up around 1940 BCE. However, the more expansionist foreign policy of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom 
caused the special relationship of Byblos to transform quickly into one of preferred partner, not exclusive partner. The nobles of Byblos still made out like bandits, and show continued Egyptian cultural influence, but now other cities of Canaan are starting to feel the touch of the Nile rather more strongly than they had before. The story of Sinyahe, one of the great works of Egyptian literature, tells the story of a royal official who's forced to flee Egypt after a palace intrigue. He takes a boat to Byblos, then goes inland to Katna, and is then taken in by the head of a minor kingdom, where he lives quietly for an extended period before returning to Egypt. Now, whether this Middle Bronze Age story has any kernel of historical truth is debated, but whatever the case, the fact that someone in the Egyptian court now had enough experience with the region to write about it tells us the world was in fact shrinking as we get into this period. That experience likely came from traders and ambassadors all throughout the region. Tradesmen now traveled as far as Ugarit independently, and ambassadors left offerings that have been recovered at the temples of many major Canaanite cities. The influence of Egypt led the kings of these cities to occasionally adopt Egyptian-style titles, and at one point a mayor of Byblos even declared himself a governor of Byblos in the Egyptian fashion, though this was almost certainly not a actual governorship where he had any real subservience to the pharaoh, since at this point Egypt still did not hold any substantial land out of what we you know, traditionally think of as Egypt proper. There was a few well-armed tribute-collecting expeditions which passed through Canaan in the Middle Bronze Age, but while this left an impression on the locals, promises of submission to the pharaoh at this point were pretty empty. Now, it wasn't only Egypt entering Canaan, however. People flowed across the border from the relatively dry and harsh lands of Syrio-Palestine to the lush green Nile Valley, looking for jobs and an easier life. These were, it seems, from pretty much all walks of life below the very top of society, with craftsmen, merchants, farmers, herdsmen, and slaves passing through. Now, I will save the question of how the Bible relates to history for another time, quite possibly a few dedicated episodes in season two. The story of Joseph's entry into Egypt from the book of Genesis, whether it's true or not, certainly fits with what we know of this period chronologically. Canaanite slaves were not uncommon in the palaces of the cities. Canaanite herdsmen tended to Egyptian flocks, and near the end of the Middle Bronze Age, Canaanites are even seen in positions of some authority under the pharaoh. All of this culminates in the Hyksos invasions, which end the Middle Kingdom and throw Egypt into the Second Intermediate Period, a time when invaders of unclear origin, but possibly from the Levant, conquered nearly all of Egypt. But Canaan is seeing changes aside from their new interactions with Egypt. Around the 1850s BCE, a good number of cities in the area start building large walls. Jerusalem, Shechem, and Ascalon in particular are noted as resistors of Egyptian influence and get attacked from the south, but it wasn't just the south that was the source of insecurity. Alongside the Amorite invasions, another group of people is on the move in the Near East. Coming from the northern hills and mountains, the Hurrians are beginning to spread into north Syria and eastern Anatolia. This migration is initially much more peaceful than the Amorite one, featuring both opportunities for trade with the newly founded Hurrian cities as well as opportunities for conflict. Things seem relatively light at first, and on the whole, the new arrivals are probably beneficial for prosperity in the region. Trade, too, is picking up as Assyrian merchants join in the club of people getting rich by moving stuff around. 
Remember, now that the Amorites have spread their rule and their dialect of Akkadian from the Levant to Mesopotamia, trade is much easier in the whole region. And seeing as the Middle Bronze Age witnesses a flourishing of trade all the way from the Aegean Sea to the Indus Valley, with the by now very well connected and practiced merchants of Canaan smack right in the middle of it all, things are going pretty well overall for the economy. Massive walls, after all, are massively expensive, and it's really a sign of regional wealth that they're being built in large numbers just as much as it's a sign of peril. But of course, it, it is also a sign of peril. More prosperity means more wealth to fight over and potentially capture. More prosperity means more people with time to set aside from producing and able to spend it on plundering instead. More prosperity means more people, which offers both more soldiers but also more demands on resources in a honestly pretty arid part of the world. The very first mention of the word Canaanite in the entire historical record comes from the 1800s in a letter from the King of Mari written to the conqueror Shamsiadad, where the King of Mari discusses his military aid to the King of Katna in that king's attack against the minor prince of a place called Rahissim, mentioning that Rahissim also had a contingent of Canaanites fighting alongside with him. Now, it's the sort of letter that tells us a lot if we're really willing to pick at it a bit. Now, first, it reminds us just how interconnected the ancient world was during times of prosperity, that all these folks were chatting and interacting on a fairly regular basis, and a king of northern Mesopotamia could be informed of tactical developments occurring over in Canaan. Also, our first known example of the word Canaanite is being used to describe an enemy, an other, someone distant from the speaker. This, as we will see, is fairly common. It's much less common for Canaanites to describe themselves at any point as Canaanite, even when the word gets used much more frequently in later records. Rather, I might call myself a man of Sidon, or of Jerusalem, or the tribe of, you know, such and such, whereas the people around me, oh, they're all Canaanites. Now, this led some modern scholars to believe that, in fact, no one ever considered themselves a Canaanite, and the word was little more than a derogatory epithet with no real geopolitical significance. But... There are enough counterexamples of this nowadays that we know Canaan was a real place in the minds of the people who lived there, even if it was rarely their primary self-description. And of course, our first look at Canaanites shows us warriors, something that we'll see quite a lot of over time, despite the fact that they're not building any empires. They're just, I guess maybe if they're all warriors, they're all fighting each other all the time, and no one's ever doing any winning. Even before this period, the Canaanites were surely fighting among themselves, city against city, tribe against tribe, and even across the social structures as well, tribe against city and so forth. But during this time, we can see more signs of it because we have more records. But in all of this, there's an open question of what exactly constitutes Canaan. In the Late Bronze Age, the term Canaan will come to encompass the area ruled by Egypt, and that general boundary, with a few exceptions, will come to be the name of the place into the Iron Age and remembered in biblical times, which, let's be honest, is probably the only reason anyone cares about questions like what exactly is the land of Canaan. However, the appearance of the term in the Middle Bronze Age, before Egyptian conquest, suggests that there may have been some region prior to that named Canaan, which became the name of the wider area later on. Alternately, the Egyptian influence on these Levantine people, even just in trade and cultural exchanges, has perhaps, according to some scholars, marked them specifically as Canaanite, even at this time, 
And in this theory, the term Canaanite actually means something like a blend of Egyptian culture laid over the native Levantine cultures. We honestly don't know at this point which of these various theories is the case, or if perhaps there's some extra theory out there that's actually the case. But it becomes important as the Iron Age rolls around to consider and track what it means to be Canaanite, though this discussion will be saved for another time. I, and in fact, I'm going to have to save quite a lot of discussion for another time. This episode was meant to be just a single mini-episode, giving some background on the Phoenicians. And already, I'm uh, kind of at full length already, and only halfway through. Not sure when part two of this series will be ready, but stay subscribed to the feed, and, you know, someday you can learn about the Levantine transition into the late Bronze Age some of the fascinating stories of the Amarna period, and the history of the main city that we're actually concerned about, Ugarit. So thank you for your patience with the reduced posting schedule, and of course, thank you for listening. <laughs>